Tonight, the Olsen twins kick off Monster Bash Weekend. First, it's frightening good fun on Family Matters. Very funny, Bozo. Followed by Halloween hijinks on Boy Meets World. It's good to be kids. Then a home possessed on Step by Step. Boom shakalaka, boom shakalaka. And who will conjure up costumes for the kids? <laughs> on Coop, it may be his Monster Bash Weekend. It all starts on TGIF. Bam. Bam. Hello and welcome to episode 9 of the Man Meets World podcast. I'm your host, Brandon, the man that is meeting the world... This is the October episode, and October, of course, means Halloween. And I'm going to have a special Halloween treat at the end of this episode, dedicated to one of our faithful listeners, Megan B., who is at Motley underscore 91 on Twitter. Uh, she's a huge Boy Meets World and Girl Meets World fan. Is And also a huge fan of horror movies. Uh, So I have a special treat for her at the end of this episode because she correctly answered the Boy Meets World trivia from episode 8. I asked, what ethnicity is Linda, who was Eric's girlfriend in the episode? The correct answer was... Hey, Dad. Hey, Weez. Hey, Weasel, check it out. Look what Linda sent for you. It's beautiful. What is it? <laughs> this is a genuine Japanese lantern. Well, that was very nice of Linda. Yeah, she brought it all the way back from Tokyo, and she wants you to have it. Look. Linda was Asian. You could see, obviously, that she is Asian, American. But that line from Eric talking about how Linda brought back a traditional Japanese lantern from Tokyo, is a hint that she is from Japanese descent. So, Megan being correctly answered Asian, she will get her Halloween treat at the end of this episode, so stay tuned. And I, of course, will have another Boy Meets World trivia question coming up in a bit. Now, bad news. I have no new iTunes reviews to read. No new ones. I beg with you people. I plead with you people. I cry on air for you people. But no, no new iTunes reviews. If you'd be so kind to leave a review on iTunes, it's a huge help for the podcast. Please do so, and I'll give you more information on how to do so at the end of this episode. Just know... There are no reviews, and I am deeply sad, except, wait a minute, what is this? Let me dry these tears of mine. It might not be an iTunes reviews, but gosh darn it, I have a Twitter review, not just from anybody, I have a Twitter review from a Boy Meets World cast member. Booyah! Fast forwarding a bit into Boy Meets World, specifically the college years, we are introduced to the beautiful Rachel, played by Maitland Ward. She is at Maitland Ward on Twitter, and she is gorgeous. She posts a lot of risque pictures. She does the same on her Snapchat, and I'm not going to lie, I have seen her boobies. She has shown full frontal, actually, and um, at the risk of sounding too pervy, me likey. So, Rachel wrote on Twitter on September 18th that she highly recommends Mammy's World Podcast. I wrote to her semi-jokingly, but she wrote, yes, I highly recommend with a blushing smiley face. Yes, I made her blush emoji style. That is the kind of charm 
I have. But that is not all. She also wrote just recently on October 4th. I wrote jokingly, again, semi jokingly, that she loves the podcast and loves the host. And she wrote, It's true. Wink emoji. BMW fans should listen. So there you have it. I'm going to say, based on those two tweets, that I am fully endorsed by Rachel for Boy Meets World, the beautiful Maitland Ward, who is really, I'm not going to lie, really doing her best job to steal me away from Topanga as the love of my life. I never thought I'd be saying these words, but I am. So thank you, Maitland Ward, for the kind words on Twitter. Please leave a review. If you do not want to go to iTunes, shout me out on Twitter, and I can read some tweets. Anyways, moving on. Today we are talking about Boy Meets World Season 1, Episode 9, a, an episode titled Class Preunion. It originally aired on November 26, 1993. Matthews. Today on Eyewitness Corey, a probing expose of the plight of the middle child. Stay with us. <laughs> so, Mr. and Mrs. Matthews, where are we taking youngest child Morgan today? Hey, Cor, we're going to Stephanie's birthday party. Doesn't your sister look adorable? Get a close-up of her new dress. <laughs> Excuse me, ma'am, did you say new dress? And is the baby of the family wearing a gold necklace? My mommy gave it to me. Lent it to you? Party, necklace, new dress, all for your daughter. Yet just last night your son was imprisoned in his room, forbidden to go to the movies with his best friends. Our daughter didn't dial random numbers in Saskatchewan just to hear people talk Canadian. <laughs> Say goodbye to your poor, exploited brother, sweetie. Bye, sorry everybody hates you. Finally, the naked truth emerges. Hey, Cor, do me a favor. No phone calls, no home shopping network, and be careful with my video camera. Have fun. <laughs> there you have it. All across America, middle children suffering at the hands of suspicious, mistrustful parents. Next week, grounded and how to cope with it. One of the interesting things about that opening scene is that it really has nothing to do with the rest of the episode. Uh, the ending scene, which also we'll get to at the end, uh, is a good follow up to that opening scene. It sort of is a bookend, um, but really has nothing to do with the overall plot of episode 9. So after the opening sequence, we go to the classroom. Corey and Minkus are in the front of the room with Mr. Feeney, and they're doing a role play. Uh, Corey is George Washington. Minkus is King George. And they're talking about taxation without representation. And Corey goes, who cares about King George and George Washington? Is every boring old guy named George? Which, of course, gets a look from Miss Duffy. Because his first name is, of course, George. Corey continues and is like, who cares about the past? I care about the future. Especially what I will be doing in the future. So this gives Mr. George an idea for an assignment. He wants the class to come up with where they're going to be 20 years from then. It'll be a class reunion, or as Minkus dubs it, class pre-union, hence the name of this episode, of the graduating class of the year 2000, which made me feel old. But every student will come to this class reunion, or pre-union, and discuss where they're at as far as career, family, etc. Now, Minkus 
being a man of taste and class, wants Topanga to be his wife. You are the graduating class of the year 2000. What is your profession? Do you have children? Are those children tormenting their sixth grade teacher? <laughs> Mr. Feeney, would it be okay if I brought my wife? Oh, come on, Minkus. What's going to marry you? <laughs> Topanga. <laughs> Stuart, I'm flattered that you would consider me as a potential life mate, but I'm not sure I even recognize the institution of marriage. Trust me, babe, I have seen the future, and it's me. <laughs> I am totally tweeting Daniel Fischel that line. Trust me, babe, I've seen the future, and it's me. I'm thinking with her recent divorce, that will be the perfect line for her to end up with me. At last. And uh, worst case, if uh, she does not respond to my tweet and ignores me, at least I know the beautiful Maitland Ward is always there. So in the next scene, we are in the cafeteria. Corey and Sean are sitting at a table with their old friend, Larry, played by Yeah Yeah from The Sandlot. We have not seen Larry, a.k.a. Yeah Yeah from The Sandlot, in a long time. I believe last time we saw him was all the way back in the Water Wars. But now here he is at the cafeteria table talking to Sean and Corey about this pre-union and about what they are going to be Larry wants to be a 6th grade teacher, just like Mr. George Feeney, because he feels like that is going to be the best way to kiss some butt. Sean wants to go, as he says, he wants to do what his father does. He wants to go as a tire salesman. And Corey wants to go as the center fielder for the Phillies. Which causes Sean and Larry to laugh. Because as Sean says, Corey, you had 33 errors in Little League last year. Now we are back at the house. And we find out... Dun, dun, dun! Morgan traded her gold necklace. Her mother's, I should say, gold necklace that she gave her. For a cheap plastic necklace... She traded to this girl named Stephanie. Now, we're going to find out soon enough that Stephanie and her mom are a couple of bitches. But I'm getting a little bit too ahead of myself. Amy, being a practical mother, being a caring mother, says, well, I will just call Stephanie's mother and explain the situation and get the gold necklace back. And Morgan goes, black, black, no trades back. Then when Amy calls the mother, the mother pulls the same card and says, black, black, no trades back. I told you that Stephanie and her mom are a bunch of bitches. But you're going to find out just how much of a bitch they are in the near future. Flash forward, it is the following day in school. Back in the classroom. It is time for the pre-union. Sean is, as he said, he was going to be a tire salesman. Correction, a fat tire salesman. And when Corey asks him why he's fat, he's like, dude, it's going to happen. It runs in the family. My dad's fat. My uncle's fat. My grandfather's fat. I'm going to be fat. Minkus is the new CEO of Microsoft. Make us thank you for my Xbox One. I appreciate it. Um, not getting the Xbox One S, at least not yet. Um, you know, I'm going to wait and see, one, if I ever get a 4K television, two, um, what Xbox has uh, coming up next, you know, see what's around the corner. But now I'm digressing. Make us, I just want to say thank you, though, for your hard work as the CEO of Microsoft. And Topanga is the president of the United States of America, the first 
female presidents. So Hillary Clinton, are you listening? If you win, sorry, you will not be the first female president. That belongs to Miss Topanga Lawrence, which makes me, I believe, the first man... President of the United States. Very ambitious, Miss Lawrence. Yes and no. Not many people want the job anymore. Oh? Why is that? Well, now that I've disbanded the military and eliminated nuclear weapons, the position is not as seductive. I see. That's rather an unusual costume for a president, isn't it? We all wear togas now. It removes the hostile competition that fashion often creates. This world of yours seems like quite a peaceful and loving place. Yes, especially since we moved all men underground and used them just for breeding. Well, a few moments ago, uh, Mr. Minkus mentioned that you were his lovely wife. Stuart and I obviously do not see eye to eye on our futures. We're married! You're breeding stock! I'll take it! <laughs> I will gladly be breeding stock for you, Daniel Official. In fact, maybe I should throw that into my tweet to her that will finally win her over. I've seen the future, babe, and it's me. Even if that means I am just breeding stock. I mean, how could I go wrong with a line like that? So, once we hear from Topanga, we hear from, yeah, yeah, Larry. And he is dressed exactly like Mr. Feeney. The suit, the sweater vest, the mustache, everything. So Feeney tells him, and this is classic, classic George Feeney, come over here, you little suck up. And then he asks him a whole series of questions about teaching. Do you know what tenure is? I can look it up. Curriculum? I can look it up. Then you are not a teacher. You are just a posa. And then when Larry gives him a puzzled look, Feeney goes, look it up. I love George Feeney. So now it is time for... The man of the half hour, Mr. Corey Matthews. And he is so excited to share his future with Feeney. But Feeney is grilling him. And Corey does not have an answer. He's like, well, you have a $6 million salary. What about inflation? Did you take that into account? How are you managing your assets? You have no education? So, in other words, Corey has what we call an incomplete future. Because you see, he received an incomplete on his assignment. As Corey said, Feeney, you threw me out. Before I even got to first base. <coughs> hold on a minute. Hold, hold on. Hold on. This is missing something. Hold on. <laughs> this was missing sad music. <laughs> so I went to go find some on YouTube. So I can have a good cry. Because, you know, I have an incomplete future, too. And you have an incomplete future. He has one and she has one. And my producer, Mikey C, he definitely has an incomplete future. I mean, he never even listens to these episodes in full, so he's not even going to hear me say this about <laughs> <laughs> all right moving on so in the following scene we are back home at the matthews household he is in the bedroom 
He is depressed. He's taking down the poster of one of his favorite baseball players. And then Eric is like, what is wrong with you? You are bumming me out. And then he starts grilling Eric on his future, just like Feeney did to him. And then he talks to his dad about the assignment. His dad's like, well, yeah, you have an incomplete future. Everybody has an incomplete future because the future has not happened yet. That is why it's called the future. But dad's like, listen, I believe in you. If you say you're going to be the center fielder of the Phillies, then I think you will be. And I thought this was interesting because, again, this is another example of Alan and Feeney sort of disagreeing. They're not going at each other's throats. They're not disagreeing outright with each other. But Alan is sort of being the yin to Feeney's yang. I'm not sure that makes sense, but it does in my sick head. And I just thought this was, this stood out. I've talked about over the last several episodes, when appropriate, I've talked about this sort of complex relationship that Alan and George have. And I think this is another example of it. You know, they have a great respect for each other, but differing opinions sometimes. Because even though their goal is the same, they want the best for Corey and the other kids. Alan is coming at it from the perspective of a father. And Feeney is, of course, coming at it from the, uh, from the perspective of the teacher. So sometimes you can have disagreeing opinions, disagreeing views. Never mind not to mention the fact that they are from different backgrounds and different generations even. So it creates this complex relationship. But they both definitely have a respect for each other. And now Amy... And Morgan have invited Stephanie and her mother, the two biatches, over the house. And Stephanie's mother is like, listen, it's not the value of the necklace. It's her attachment to it. Because if season one of Boy Meets World has taught us anything, it's that douchey people talk like this. Just like that woman from the private academy who came to give Corey his IQ test when everybody thought he was a genius. So yeah, she's a, a real DB. So Amy and the mom, they're talking in the living room. Morgan brings Stephanie into the kitchen and Lo and behold, Stephanie is just a kid. So Morgan is bribing her with fake diamond crowns, with brownies, and even a My Little Pony. And Stephanie comes out into the living room with all these things on her. Her mother is frightened. She looks flabbergasted, if you will. I love that word. And... The end result, though, is that Morgan has gotten the gold necklace back. And Amy, dropping the mic, says, You have to understand, it's not the value of the necklace. It's her attachment to it. Oh, and by the way, My Little Pony is not cheap, bitch. So, Morgan is getting a car now, too. Because Stephanie said she could have it. Boom. That's like a double mic drop. And now in the next scene, Alan has a very special once-in-a-lifetime surprise. Uh, Eric and Corey are both freaking out over this. But it's really intended for Corey to inspire him and give him motivation to reach his goals and shoot for the stars and have dreams so Alan has gotten a famous baseball player to the house now for some of you out here this is going to be an easy one but here is your boy meets world trivia the boy meets world trivia question for episode 9 is 
who is the baseball player? And I'm even though I think this is an easier one, I'm going to give you two big hints. One, he played for the New York Yankees. And two, he only has one hand. That's right. One freaking hand. And he played in the major leagues. For the Yankees, no less. I hate the Yankees because I'm from Boston. But, you know, they've had some success over the years. Now, Corey and Eric are freaking out. Corey called Sean. Like, you got to come over here right away. Right away. So-and-so is here. And this famous baseball player gives a very motivated a motivational speech to Corey, but he also stresses the importance of education and going to college in case the major leagues do not work out. And it turns out that uh, Alan sort of stalked this guy a little bit and sent like 63 telegrams to him, which, I mean, I can relate to because I probably have sent at least 63 telegrams to Daniel Fischel, because, I mean, everybody sends telegrams these days in 2016. But Corey goes, how did you know he would show up? And Alan says to Corey, I didn't know. But a guy can dream, can't he? And then at this time, Sean, Larry, and a bunch of others, including Minkus, burst through the living room door, and everybody's holding a baseball for this famous baseball player to sign. Of course, except for Minkus, who shows up with a basketball. Doi! Now, this is followed by a nighttime scene where Corey is talking to Feeney outside because, of course, they're neighbors. And Feeney is acting sort of like a prude, I gotta say. Corey is throwing a, a baseball into the air and ends up on his on Feeney's property ends up on his side of the fence and he asks for the ball back and Feeney's like respect my property line and I will respect your property I know that Feeney sounds nothing like that but it seems like an appropriate voice for that line whatever screw you guys okay you're gonna make me cry again Ugh. so they have a conversation, though, about the assignment, and Corey's like, you know, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to work hard, and nobody's going to stop me. And when Feeney sees that Corey took other things into consideration, like going to school and getting an education, so he had something to fall back on. And when he sees that Corey knows it's going to take a lot of hard work and practice and training to reach his goal so he has a complete future if you will Feeney decides that Corey has done well with the assignment and as a gift Corey goes so does this mean I get an A and Feeney instead pours a bucket of baseballs that belong to Corey back into the Matthews yard and he goes play ball now, we're in the final scene, and I'm a little bit disturbed by this. I'm not going to lie. Listen to yourself. You tell me. Is this disturbing? Does it ever bother you that I never built bridges? What? I never became an engineer. Well, does it bother you? Oh, once in a while. You think you're married a failure? You've got a, a really good job where people respect you. You have three beautiful children who are fast asleep in their little beds. And you have a wife who has absolutely nothing to do for the next half hour. So, what are you saying? Hmm? <laughs> Something interesting. This kissing stuff is not going to hold my audience's attention. 
and it was holding my attention until the news crew showed up. Come on, guys, this is television. How about a little action? Oh, okay, you want action? How about a chase scene? Give me that camera. Right. Give me the camera. Right. Give me that camera. So in that scene, Corey is back with the camera, which again, it's a bookend to the opening scene. But this time, he's videotaping his parents making out and encouraging them to engage in a little action. Is Corey trying to film his parents doing it? Is that my pervy self reading into that? Or can we all agree that's what he's trying to do. And if that is what he's trying to do, is that, I mean, that is really disturbing, right? Right? Is it just me or? Please, I'm serious. Share me your thoughts on Twitter, which you can reach me at, at MMWPod, at MMWPOD. Please also tweet me your responses for the Boy Meets World trivia. Who is the famous baseball player that comes to visit Corey? Again, the hint is he played for the New York Yankees and has one hand. Finally, I would say I would give this episode five out of five Feenies. You know, it's really, I rate each episode, it's really hard for me to give anything lower than a three, I would say, because this is my favorite show of all time, so I'm a little bit biased when I'm rating these. But, I mean, this has everything you want in a Boy Meets World episode. It has comedy, it had uh, a little bit of drama, has all of your favorite characters with Sean and Topanga and Corey, and I'm every time I see Sean and Topanga on screen, I'm just really looking forward to the later seasons when they're a bigger focal point of the show, because those are two fantastic characters. Same thing with Eric. Um... But we will get there in time. Next time on Mammy's World, we enter double digits. Episode 10, where we look at season one, episode 10, of course, of Boy Meets World. Now, very last thing before we sign off. Megan B, I owe you a treat for getting the trivia question episode 8 correct. And as I said, this is a spooky Halloween treat. Like I said at the beginning, you are a fan of horror movies. So am I. I am hoping you enjoy this classic. I'm going to play you the audio of the trailer to the original Halloween Of course, that movie gave birth to one of the biggest villains in horror movie history, the one and only Mr. Michael Myers. Here is the trailer for Halloween, released in 1978. The one, the only, the classic Halloween. Halloween night, a small American town, 15 years ago. seven trying to keep him locked up because i realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil <laughs> i think he'll come back exploring uncharted territory it's totally charged just talk. Sure. Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. the only reason she babysits to have a Halloween. 
Come on out. that one i hope it was spooky enough for you since this is the october episode of man meets world please go to itunes review 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 so i have something to read on air at the very least send me some complimentary tweets that i can read on air just like the beautiful maitland ward aka rachel from boy meets world also while you're at itunes Subscribe, 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 subscribe. Download, catch up if you, this is your first time tuning in or you just have not listened to all the episodes because you're lazy. Please, download, subscribe, review. Download, subscribe, review. Download, subscribe, review on iTunes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been working all day and recording for the last... 40 minutes and now I'm going insane. I'm going crazy. So I gotta stop recording now so I can get my sanity back. Also, we're on YouTube, by the way. Check us out on YouTube. Check us out on Stitcher. And of course, check us out on our home site, fansonexperts.com. Follow my producer, editor, and the founder of Fanson Experts at Mikey underscore C on Twitter. Once again, I am at MMW Pod. Send me your answers for the trivia question. Have a happy Halloween and class dismissed. That's not experts.